some businesses get it so wrong. Okay, so a lot of businesses are still not getting the customer experience absolutely right. Well, the reason why is that they have a cycle of decline. Organizations deliver poor end-to-end -end experience. Yeah? So by delivering poor end-to-end -end experience, what happens next? Customers defect. Customers leave. Customers stop wanting to do business. What happens? Organizations focus their attention on customer acquisition in order to fill the gaps. Okay? So they focus on new customers. What then happens is organizations lose their focus on the current customers. What happens? Customers defect at a faster rate. Okay? And then what happens? Business becomes more focused on customer acquisition to fix the hole in the leaky bucket. They pour more water in the top. Basically, customer lifetime value could be thought about as the total profit generated by a customer over time, over the time of their relationship. So, what determines customer lifetime value? This isn't how you calculate it. This is just meant to explain. Okay, so, we've got to think about it as a series of steps, as a journey. Hence the reason we're bringing up the customer journey before. So we market to an audience, some of those respond, generating leads, some of which convert into customers who buy ever so often, generating a sales volume, average revenue per sale, etc., etc., until we get to the point where we calculate the customer lifetime value of all of those people that we've marketed to. Simplistic way of looking at it. Okay, so let's have a look at an example. We market to 10,000 um, 10, people, 2% respond, we get 200 leads. 40% conversion rate, meaning we end up with 80 customers. Those customers buy from us every two and a half years, so that's 0.4. Generating 32 sales, average revenue per sale of uh, 1,000 pounds, creating a sales value of 32,000. Gross profit, profit 50%, giving, uh, sorry, gross margin 50%, giving a gross profit of 16,000. Referral ratio of 1.2. So what this is, is that every fifth customer refers another customer to us, in this particular example here. Giving us a referral profit, 19,200 pounds. We retain those customers for three years. So we sell to them every two and a half years, but we retain them for uh, three years. Giving us 57,600. Now, if we use this, then clearly we would take that 57,600 and divide it by the 80 customers that we've created here. And that's a, a ballpark figure of uh, how to calculate cu customer lifetime value. This is Manners and Murphy, the guys who provided us with the statistics at the, at the, at the very beginning of the presentation. Okay? Now, where did they get their figures from? Okay, if we said, okay, we can find ways of justifying a 10% improvement in what we do across these metrics at the top, what will that do to the profit at the bottom line? Okay, so we improve our response rate from 2 to 2.2%, giving us more leads. Improve our conversion rate from 40 to 40, uh, 44%. We improve our perfect purchase frequency from 0.4 to 0.44%. We improve our revenue per sale by uh, 100 pounds, by 10 uh, percent. And fun we keep on going like this, and what we end up with is a customer lifetime value of 112,000, compared to 56,000. Now, I'm not saying that we can really, really simply just come along and add 100 pounds on and we've solved the problem. We can only add 100 pounds on if we make our product uh, differentiated enough from the competition that we can justify that ex ad additional expense. Interestingly, though, this uh, referral ratio may be something that we can infer from MPS. So when we look at this model and we consider all of the different metrics that exist within the organization, we can use those metrics to our advantage in order to help us ascertain all these different things on the customer life lifetime. If we start looking at the business in, the way, in this way, you can probably see that we're forcing sales and customer service and product marketing and everybody within the organ and finance, everybody in the organization to look at the customer from the same perspective, from the same financial perspective. The value chain. This is a model from uh, uh, Michael Porter. It's a few years old. And basically what it says is which parts of your organization are adding value or detracting value. 
Okay, but it's not just the uh, areas of your business adding value and detracting value, it's also the, the supply chain as well, because your organization is part of the supply chain. Okay, and sometimes different parts of the supply chain can take control of the supply chain. So if I, I'm going to do a little quiz now. If I go, da 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 da, what do you think of? Bum 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 bum. Intel. Okay, can you actually go out and buy an Intel Pentium processor on the high street? You actually, you can, but most people don't realize that you can, but it's not usually the way you buy an Intel Pentium processor. The way you typically buy an Intel Pentium processor is going to a computer. But the th uh, going to a computer shop and buying a computer. But they took control of their supply chain by saying, you know what? We're actually going to market to the end user. And now if you go and buy a computer and you want a new computer, what do you ask? What's the question you ask when they try and sell you something with an AMD processor? No, 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 no. I want something with an Intel. So these guys took control of their supply chain. They changed the value for themselves within the supply chain by marketing directly to the end users. Customer journey mapping. So if we turn this into an example of a hotel, we arrive at the hotel, we drive up the, the path of the hotel, it looks wonderful, that gives us positive value. So I've given that plus one. We give the uh, bags to the porter who smells of cigarettes and smoking. His, uh, sm he's been smoking, so he smells a little bit, and, and you know, he grunts at us. He nearly pulls our arm off when he takes our bags with us. So that gives us a minus two value. Then next of all, we go to check-in. They, they give us a great experience. We go to our room. It's even better. Plus two on the value scale here. We receive our bags. It's the same guy who nearly pulled our arm, arm off. All of a sudden, we're not very happy. N minus one value. We then sleep and have a shower. Good experience. Room service. Good experience. We receive the food. It's cold. We don't like it, that gives us a bad experience. We, eat and, we uh, e eat and sleep, and then we check out and leave. When we get to check out, the people who checked us in were not the same people as who checked us out. We have a bad experience. Overall, if we take all of these variables at the top, we end up with a slightly positive experience. But if we can look at those particular moments on the journey and say, okay, where are the ones with problems, then clearly we can fix those problems. And if we look at the MPS methodology, the closed loop system helps people to do that. Okay? Uh, but we can't just think about what happens in the front office, what happens with the frontline staff. There's also this whole process, this whole journey is supported by people in the background that you never get to see. So the entire organization, as we understand, is responsible for delivering a great customer experience. There are lots of different metrics within an organization that can help us. There are the external perception-based metrics, as I like to call them, including things like NPS, CSAT, CES, but also measures within the organization that give us an indication as to whether the customer is getting a good experience or not. So things like uh, the CLV, which we've spoken about, persistency churn, average speed of answer, repeat call rates, etc. All of these things are important for the business as well. So we have a series of value-added to adding tools that we can utilize to improve the experience of the business. And coming from a marketing background, I think the way we control the experience is by controlling the seven Ps. And the application of seven Ps from a functional and emotional perspective. If we look at um, that model that I showed you about the gap between what the customer expects and what the customer gets, that's what we end up with here, okay? So across the journey, we are, what we're trying to do is close the gap between what the customer gets and what the customer expects. But in some instances, what we can end up, we might decide that we want to wow customers. Now there's a lot of talk about wowing customers, but I think there's some danger in wowing customers as well. Sometimes you can wow customers to a, such, a, such an extent that they expect to be wowed every single time. If we think about iPhone, okay, they had the iPhone 3, the 3GS, and then all of a sudden they launched, launched the iPhone 4, which was an absolutely fantastic product. Yeah? Steve Jobs did some ama amazing things. He said, I want a titanium strip around the outside of the phone. His R&D people said that he, they thought he was mad, but he created such a brilliant product. Then Samsung launched their product, and the next thing that happened was that the iPhone 4 GS was launched as a response to Samsung. 
And the difference between the iPhone 4 and the iPhone 4S was what? What does the S stand for? <coughs> Siri. Yes, Siri, the, the voice interaction thing. A lot of people got the iPhone 4S and went... They'd been wowed so much by the iPhone 4 that when the iPhone 4 came, S came out, they became more massively underwhelmed. Then the iPhone 5, and everybody was looking at the iPhone 5 going, well, it's like the iPhone 4, but just a bit thinner, really. Be interested to see this, the new iPhone 6. So for, the for 20 years, the reason why I love... Uh, uh, first Direct is they wow me not by anything specific and magical they do at a particular touch point but because of the consistency of what they do. So it is possible to wow your customers without wowing them. There's a lot of talk about whether we should actually divest customers. Should we really boot them out? There is a danger with talking about divesting. I don't really like the phrase divesting customers. But the, co the conversation about is the customer still king? Okay, so when I go on to discussions on LinkedIn about whether we should actually divest customers or not, there are some people going, no, of course we shouldn't. We should develop a new proposition that enables us to serve the, those customers' needs. But how many millions of pounds do you have to plow into developing a new proposition to make a few people happy? Okay, so not always realistic. If you do that, you could end up devaluing the brand because you're no longer servicing your core proposition. I'm not suggesting for a second that businesses can stand still and do the same thing all the time. Clearly, they have to keep on moving, but they have to stick with their strengths because it's their strengths that enable them to exploit the weaknesses within the marketplace. And if you don't end up doing that, you could end up uh, uh, devaluing your brand. You need to focus on what you, need, what you do best Otherwise, you end up being a jack of all trades, a master of none. Or if you don't, you could end up like Woolworths. Everybody remembers the Woolworths experience. You wander into a Woolworths shop, what happened? Everybody remembers the pick and mix, and the, uh, where you could buy the, the, the seven-inch singles. But beyond that, what could you buy? Lots of different things, but it differed from week to week. You didn't know what their promise was. You didn't know what they really, really sold because they changed their stock so much. They didn't focus to such an extent that all of a sudden people didn't know what Woolworths was about. People didn't know what Woolworths stood for. It's important. We need to segment the market and we need to focus on the segments that we can tackle best. I don't like to think about divesting customers. I like to think about the fact that sometimes, you know, you're incompatible. Sometimes you end up with a customer who you shouldn't have ended up with. It's not that you, you should divest them. It's just that they came to you and they shouldn't have done and you did business with them and you probably shouldn't have done. There's nothing wrong with helping them out. And I did some work with a utilities company last year and they do exactly this.